Hello and welcome everybody to ICMDA webinars. I'm your host, Dr. Peter Saunders, the Chief Executive of the International Christian Medical and Dental Association. And today we're privileged to have Dr. Tan Lai Yong uh, speaking to us on the subject of training village healthcare workers. It's a pleasure to have today Dr. Tan Lai Yong uh, speaking to us. Dr. Tan spent 15 years between 1996 and 2010 running village health worker training programs in Yunnan in China. And during his webinar, he's going to share his insights, uh, some mistakes made, and also reflections upon his experiences over that time as well. By way of introduction, Associate Professor Tan Lai Yon graduated as a medical doctor from the the National University of Singapore, the NUS, in 1985. And in 1996, he and his family relocated to Yunnan in China, where he was involved in poverty alleviation, community development, and training of village health workers. He joined the College of Alice and Peter Tan, the CAPT, as a resident fellow in 2012, and was the director for outreach and community engagement from 2012 to 2020. He also taught short courses at the Division of Family Medicine uh, at the uh, National University of Singapore, and he was given the NUS Annual Teaching Excellence Award in 2013. As a three-time recipient at a Residential Colleges Teaching Excellence Award, Dr. Tan was given the NUS Residential Colleges Teaching Excellence Award Honor uh, Roll and he's married with two grown, grown children. He enjoys the outdoors. He's taken part in several wilderness medicine training courses and has also led steer trips, uh, 10 of them all together, to places like Botswana, China, India, and Myanmar. So from Singapore, with great experience in China, but with a real international perspective too on the subject of training village healthcare workers, Dr. Tan, it's just a pleasure to have you here today on ICM Day webinars, and we really look forward to hearing what you have to say and to the discussion afterwards. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you, everyone from all over the world, for this time of sharing. Uh, I will use videos and also slides, and later on, look forward to the question time so that we can dialogue together. Okay, my name is Lai Yong. Um, I'm 62 years old, born in Singapore, had the privilege of uh, studying in Canada too. And I don't really speak Chinese uh, when I graduated. So I always thought I will go to India or Pakistan to work, but God has a sense of humor. So I ended up working in China. And I would think my role was to train village health workers. This is the 1990s when up in the remote areas, um, there was still widespread poverty. Things have changed very much. But uh, one of the reasons why I succeeded so-called was because I had to go in as a listener, as a learner, because I couldn't really speak the local language. And so it took me some time to learn the language and therefore learn the culture and enter as a novice. So maybe the slides. So there's a first lesson to share that in training village doctors uh, or in entering any third culture is good to go in as a learner. So greetings from my family. Uh, there's my little girl. She's my older daughter. She's now 28. When we went over, she was about slightly older than a year, not yet two. And she's in an Aka dress. So I went to Yunnan in China. They are very colorful. This is a typical embroidery bag that they use. So we work among the Hue tribes or the minority ethnic groups. In Mandarin, it's called Sao Su Bing Chu. That's my son. He's now 25. And uh, so they enjoyed their time working in the countryside. I'm very grateful to my wife. She's an accountant by training. She used to teach in a university here. And uh, well, she was very brave. She is very brave. 
give them all, give that up to join our fam, join us as a family uh, to serve in Yunnan in China. Next slide. So training village health workers in resource poor communities. So this picture uh, of a hillside village can be found in many parts of the world. Uh, Northeast India, I've never been to South America, but I am sure there are villages like this. Of course, in China, uh, in many parts of Asia. So remote places, low resource, but see the picture of the two stools. These are two chairs which they made. Uh, they're also highly innovative. Take a close look. The chairs are covered by, I think in this case is buffalo skin. The hair is still on the skin. So very innovative, uh, low resource, but they make use of whatever resources they have. Uh, to make life better. So I, that's the second lesson I learned. When we train village health workers in resource poor communities, partner them to learn innovation. Next slide. So I went to Yunnan, Y-U-N-N-A-N. This is uh, where China meets uh, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam. It's right at the corner at the bottom of uh, southwestern China. And uh, these are minority ethnic group in the mountains. Most of them do not speak the national language. They will speak the national language that is Mandarin or Putonghua only if they have been to school. So I went there at 35 years old, 1996, thinking that we will spend perhaps three or four or five years but God is gracious, we stayed up to 2010. And one of the reasons we came back was because my children, they attended a local school in China. And uh, we thought that, wow, the curriculum in the Chinese high school is just too much. We wanted them to come back to Singapore. Most Singaporeans think that our high school are very rigorous and uh, pressurized, but much more in China. So we came back so they, they can have a, a more... Uh, uh, a more holistic uh, teenage school life. So that was Yunnan. Next slide. So we were with a group that had the idea of caring for the poor. Okay, so we work with the poor from different spectrum, often leprosy affected, disabled children. How do we care for the poor? Next slide. by sharing knowledge. Okay, so uh, I had a Filipino friend, a couple, they were agricultural expert and they taught farming skills. So for me, since I'm from a healthcare background, we taught healthcare problem solving, which turns formats into training village doctor worker, village health workers. Next slide. So caring for the poor, sharing knowledge, so for me, my class of village doctors, uh, usually, and this, this is 1990s, huh? things have changed much, but they will be about 18 to 22 years old from very remote village. In this class, I had to take 12 to 16 hours of bus to the small town. They had to walk about four hours to take seven hours of bus to meet me and that was our training situation and they would likely be the only ones in their village who could read and write that's why they were appointed or selected to be the village health workers so sharing uh, caring for the poor by sharing knowledge next slide loving people uh i think all over the world uh, people know if they are just a project or if they are research or you're going there just to fulfill some task uh, because they are resource poor, they often will be obedient uh, to what task we want to do, but they sense it much more. 
when we bring God's love. So caring for the poor, sharing knowledge, and loving people. Okay. Next slide. Okay. So one way I thought to see uh, is to share a video. This video was made by a TV station in Singapore. I'm a bit shy to say that uh, it shows me, but actually it should be showing the team. But because it was a media event, they just show me. So uh, maybe we can watch the video and see the village uh, that we were working in and how we designed the training courses. Uh, okay. I hope the sound is clearer now. There is a rough beauty to Sichuan Bana, a mountainous province at the southernmost tip of Yunnan, China. More than two-thirds of her people are ethnic minorities, and the tough terrain had made necessities like healthcare and education hard to reach. Until a passionate doctor from Singapore chose to make his rounds here. For 13 years, Dr. Tan Lai Yong has been on duty here in Yunnan. He's a lecturer at the Kunming Medical College, but is regarded as a healer and a teacher by people far beyond the classroom of a medical school. Dr. Tan has been actively involved in training village doctors. Most village doctors in the region are farmers who've barely finished high school and are ill-equipped to handle the illnesses and injuries brought to their attention. By designing the curriculum, imparting knowledge, providing financial help and handling daunting logistical problems, Dr. Tan has been pivotal in empowering the village's help and heal themselves. When I first came, I was trying to understand the role of the village doctors. We usually draw pictures of kids, women, old people, and we ask them to name the commonest three diseases they face. And then we start our curriculum from there. From basic diagnosis to mother and child health, to control of infectious disease, and also to get them out of the village clinic into the community to do preventive health. Can okay, we pause here for a while? I'm done. Okay, so this is a video that they made about me, but actually uh, they should make it of my mentors, the people who taught me. So for example, my mentors taught me, you know, when we, we doctors like to carry a stethoscope, right? And uh, if you watch the video again, it's on YouTube, you will realize that I didn't have the stethoscope on me. It was on my student. So that was deliberate. And if you understand Asian culture, you would have noticed that I deliberately, I was taught to sit at a chair lower than my student. Now, that's a no-no, okay? Usually as a teacher, I should be sitting in a place of honor. And, uh, but my, my, my trainers, my mentors taught me that I should walk into the village instead of being driven into the village. Uh, it's good for my health. Uh, the stethoscope, the symbol of the doctor, the power, should be on the village doctor. And she would be the one handling the patient. And I should be the one, when I visit my village doctors, to ask questions, whisper into her ear, check with her about the diagnosis, about the treatment. And if she's correct, hallelujah. Because next time, when the village kid have a problem, the parents will find her. If I did everything, then the parents will find me. So that's not sustainable. So, uh, and then our curriculum was very student-oriented. The students drew pictures uh, of children, pregnant women, elderly, and draw pictures about what illnesses, what problems they face. And we solve them from there. So the curriculum was designed from ground up, not from top down. Okay. So those are some of the things I wanted to point out. Okay. That my mentors taught me 
to sit lower, hand over the stethoscope to the students. Don't be the expert, but be the encourager. Okay, let's carry on with the video. A member of the Dai tribe is one of over 2,000 village doctors who had undergone both the theoretical and practical training. He set up his small but well-stocked clinic three years ago. Now seeing about 20 patients a day, Wen Dan has earned a reputation as a kind and honest doctor throughout the valley. It's a far cry from the days when he had to work from a shack and struggle to feed his family. Woman,先上山,啊,在那个小药,但是拿回来了,但是没有多少效果,没有多少效果,所以呢,换了我们,啊,换了那个,有人来教我们,得到了,神老师他们,帮助我们的以后,把那,卫生级,还有我们当地的
It's hard to define what Dr. Tan has achieved across so many fields, but perhaps this passage from Lao Tzu, which he likes, is a good summary. Go to the people, live among them, learn from them, love them, start with what they know, build on what they have, and for the best leaders, when their task is accomplished, the people will remark, we have done it ourselves. I remember a saying that has uh, always encouraged me on, you know, any person could take an apple, right? Cut an apple and count the number of seeds in it. But only God knows the number of apples in one seed. And so what little things we do, it can blossom to many, many fruits. Thank you. So that video, I think, summary. And uh, so I think with technical things aside, uh, training village health workers is about caring and empowering. Uh, I would uh, take questions soon. Next slide. Uh, those were years ago, uh, caring and empowering villagers to take care of their own health, equipping some specialist staff, village health workers, but also interacting on a community level interacting with caregivers, grandparents. Uh, next slide. You say next slide. So now that I'm back in Singapore and very privileged to teach at NUS, uh, through COVID, National University of Singapore asked me to make a video. This is a shorter video uh, on reflecting about finding resilience in training village doctors. Uh, again, uh, maybe we can go and watch this video and after that we open for uh, questions. In the previous story, I shared about being trampled on by grass. Today, I just want to share with you about growing tall like a tree. Take 15 seconds, sketch a tree. When I do this uh, with my students, most students will draw a tree. And that's our impression of the tree. And I just want to point out to you that when I went to Yunnan, I learned that in many of the village farmers that I work with, a tree must include the roots. Somehow, we in the city are very good at seeing the tangibles, the quantifiable, but it's always the quality of the roots that count. In 1996, my family and I moved to Yunnan in China, where we work among poverty-affected rural communities. Among the healthcare and educational projects that we did, we also did tree planting where we planted fruit trees because they will bring in income to the farmers as well as prevent soil erosion. These are two miniature wooden buckets. They can carry water. Buckets like this almost triggered a misunderstanding with me and my farming friends. You see, we were planting walnut and chestnut trees up in the mountains. And I asked them, when is the best time to plant trees? I had asked the agricultural experts in the city and they told me in the rainy season. But when I asked these farmers and they told me the best time to plant the tree is deep in winter. There was no leaves, everything was dry. Who should I listen to? Well, I opted to listen to Ground Zero, the farmers. And so deep in winter, very cold, when it was dry and there was no leaves, we bought hundreds of chestnut and walnut tree, small trees, and we climbed up into the mountains to plant the tree. It was very tiring. Go up in the mountain, dig a hole, plant, put fertilizers, put compost, and then plant the tree. And we thought the work was done. And then the farmer looked at me, say, Hai Pu Sing, no, not yet. We must now go to the valley to collect water. I said, what? It's a long walk down, and to carry water 
if you just provide two liters of water for each tree, we planted hundreds of trees. So I asked him, I said, do you remember why you told me to plant the trees in winter? He said, yeah, deep in winter, the trees are like the baby, fast asleep. If you tr transplant them, they don't wake up. If you move them near spring, it's like baby waking up already. You touch them, they will uh, suddenly wake up. So we want to plant the tree deep in winter when they are deep asleep and you don't damage them, better results. So I told him, I said, yeah, I understand that. Why must I water? Why must I go down one kilometer and carry the water up? A humble farmer, shy, uh, but he had to correct me. He said, Chen Yisen, Dr. Tan, you must understand, deep in winter, the leaves don't grow, the branches don't grow, the flowers don't grow, but the roots always grow. You must look after the roots. In this time of COVID, when our growth seems to be hampered, it is a time to build our roots. So what are our roots? Our values, our convictions, integrity, honesty, joy, peace. So in this time of COVID in Singapore, I'm reminded that I need to water my roots, even though it's very tough. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, okay. Uh, that's what I wanted to share for now. Maybe it's time for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Tan. We've been listening to Dr. Tan on training village healthcare workers. We've now got a time for the Q and A. So uh, we've got some some questions here. First of all, from from Selma Farmi, uh, Dr. Tan is asking, how did you keep yourself updated? Did you have mentors or others to ask? How often did you meet or keep in contact with them? Yes, uh, this was the time before internet. So uh, the old fashioned way of reading journals. Uh, there is a very good book called The Whole Series Where There Is No Doctor in the Village by the Hesperian Foundation. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. Or there is where there's no dentist in the clinic. These are basic manuals that we refer to and uh, once a year I will still go back to Singapore to visit my parents uh, you know it's kind of strange cultural I said that I went to China when I was 35 years old already a doctor uh, but in our society we still have to ask our parents permission okay so uh, one of the uh, the the filial piety act was to come back and to visit my parents and my in-laws every year. So when I come back to Singapore, I will also try to attend a medical conference. I would uh, pull some strings and uh, do some ward rounds with my classmates. And uh, so keeping alive. And uh, fortunate also that in China, there is a vibrant uh, medical, continuing medical education going on. So that's how I kept contact. Thank you. And you must have seen a huge amount of changes, particularly in medical uh, literature mm -hmm. during the time you were there. What mm -hmm. time, what role did your wife and children play in your ministry there? Your the daughter was not even two, your son was even not even born, I think, when you went. Your wife is an accountant, but they were there with you for uh, the whole period. What, what role did they play in your ministry there? Well, when we went there, uh, we brought two years supply of diapers and milk powder because it was just not available. And my wife calculated the needs of the diapers in ascending size mm -hmm. as the child grow and descending number because the child needs less. And I'm, I'm amazed by her calculation because at the end of two years, she was shot by one packet. <laughs> so uh, very good support. And like I shared that actually 
we are there not just to perform a task, we were there to build relationships. We were there to model what parenting is about. Not that we are perfect parents, uh, but uh, China had a one-child policy. I think you would have read that in many set settings, children were being spoiled. Uh, so they were watching, always watching. Now, when we went to China, we live in a commune. Okay, what they call a tan way. Okay, that means we we live in a, a compound where everybody work in the same uh, company. So you got to know your neighbors very well because you will see them every day. Uh, there was not, there's still privacy, but not as much as you understand in a city. So people were always watching what we were doing. And uh, after a while, they will come to my wife to ask about, should we feed this to our children? Why don't you have a television in your house? You don't give sweets to your children, uh, things like that. So uh, the influence is like salt and light. How much were your children able to integrate? And did they go to local schools? Did they learn the local languages? How much did they interact with the local children? Well, they went to local school. We were one of the few foreigners in our, in fact, in our compound, we were the only foreigners. Uh, so they, they grew up like a local kid. So at home, we spoke English, but outside the home, uh, they would speak uh, whatever language is out there. And they attended local school. So my daughter attended local school all the way to high school. There were international schools in our locality, but we opted to go to a local school. Mm -hmm. And what were the, Charles Okafor here is asking, what were the major challenges you faced in the mission field and how did you overcome them? I know that's a big, a big question, but maybe just briefly uh, in adapting to a completely different culture and language and, of course, a, from the city of Singapore to a very remote rural location. What, what were the major challenges you faced and how did you overcome them? Uh, identity. The first one is identity. When we went over, I mean, we were very accomplished people in Singapore, right? We have, we have our jobs, we had our network. So when we went down, we, we, people wondering, why did you come? Who are you? You know, uh, and the more you try to explain, the more they, they think, what is, tell me more. Tell me the, the truth. So why did you come? <laughs> you know, so identity, uh, it took about two to three years to find our identity, to build relationships in the community. Uh, for example, if you have no identity, you do not know the gossip. Mm -hmm. uh, gossip can be very important because for one time, for example, all our neighbors knew through gossip that there will be no electricity the following day. But because we were not part of the gossip circle, we were caught unawares that there was going to be electricity cut for the following week or so. And so we said, what's happening? What's happening? And they said, don't you know? Everybody knows that there is not going to be electricity these few days. Didn't you prepare for it? Or no water for a week. And people will store up water. I said, but we didn't know. We didn't get the notice because we were not part of the community yet. So that is a big struggle. It takes some time uh, to get your footing in the community. Like I used to take tricycles, trishaws, right? Rickshaws. That was my favorite way of transportation, rickshaws. And then I bought a refrigerator and it's quite, it's tough, but the way to transport the refrigerator back to my home was to put it on a rickshaw. I waited for half an hour. There was no rickshaw. Then I turned around and asked someone. I said, why aren't there rickshaws yesterday? He said, don't you know? Starting yesterday, rickshaws can no longer come here. They were 
no more. Okay, the police just said no more. So I was standing by the roadside with a brand new refrigerator thinking, how am I going to get home? Because I wasn't part of the community. That's a tough part. Hmm. Now that's, that's really interesting, that, um, your identity of the community. Eric Munge is from Papua New Guinea. He's asking, how did you manage to grow your faith in Christ while in China? What You've talked about some of the cultural and linguistic challenges, but what were the challenges you faced uh, in your faith? Mm -hmm. So Taiwan identity, in Singapore, I think our faith was very much um, tied with what we could do. Right? We could need Bible studies. We could, uh, we could have Christmas outreach. We can have a Easter event. But then when we enter China, it was quite different. And uh, if I may read in Psalms thirty-seven, Psalms thirty-seven, it was a whole paradigm change. Psalms thirty-seven verse three: Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. So the, the discipleship didn't become me focus. Right? Mm -hmm. It become trust in the Lord. Yes, do what is good. Dwell in the land. You know, this concept of dwelling in the land. Uh, in Singapore, I just go home. After a busy day work, I just go home. Have my dinner and then rest and sleep and be ready for the next day. It's kind of like chop, 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 right? So Psalms 37 verse, the whole of Psalm 37 is very encouraging to me that trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desire. So the focus is back to the Lord, and that helped me a lot. Psalm 37. Thank you. Um, one of my favorite Psalms, too, Psalm 37. May uh, Potashnik is asking, what's happened after you've left? What's the current situation of the village health workers in Yunnan? And what, what happened af after you left? Well, we couldn't go for the past three years. We used to visit. Now, China changes rapidly. Uh, in the second half of my stay, I was associated with the university medical school. Okay. So this era of village health workers is a passing phase. There were university were training more doctors who will one day filter down to the village. So for about 20 years, uh, these village doctors that we train continue to be the main caregiver in their remote villages. But the law required them to have licenses. So we modify our training program. We combine them with the local, more like polytechnics, health colleges, and we ran short courses for them so that they could pass the ever-increasing number of exams. Okay. So we build them up to their stage. Not everybody pass, but fair number of them pass to get the, the new licenses. Three or four years ago, when I went back, uh, many of the village doctors say, oh, we, we don't need to be the frontline caregivers now. So I say, what do you do? They say, oh, uh, in our villages, we also have, they also have the aging population. In the past, the elderly would just stay in the home of the children, but now the children have gone to the city to work. So lo and behold, our village doctors became senior caregivers, caregivers to the seniors, which I think fits very well. They were their own minority ethnic group. They were trained medically and uh, uh, they knew how to take care of high diabetes and high blood pressure by then. So many of them evolved to be the caregivers for senior citizen home. There are some of them who still continue to be practicing village doctors. And uh, so things have evolved and we are glad to see the changes. Mm. 
Thank you. So the needs are very different now than when you first went. Mm -hmm. uh, Bettina Schenk is asking, do you offer your teaching, personal journey, learnings and insights anywhere online? Have you got a, a website that we can give people afterwards? Um, I, I'm not brave enough to have a blog or a website. <laughs> I can, <laughs> yeah. Uh, perhaps what I can do is maybe at this time, uh, well, I've written this book, uh, Biting the Bamboo. Yeah. It's just uh, English and there's a Chinese version. If you email me, I'm, I will endeavor to mail the book to you. If you email me your address, uh, I will send it by surface mail, maybe take a month. I'm going to India next week. So those of you uh, who are from India, if you email me your address, I'll be happy to mail the book out from India. And some of my friends are going to the ICMDA uh, conference in Tanzania, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, those of you uh, over in the Africa, if you, if you just email me, I can put my email if you wish to have this book to read about the experiences. I'll be happy to send them to you. You don't have to pay me. Uh, it's about $5 US dollars. Just put it into your local CMDA funding or you can put it in a local church offering. You don't have to pay me. I'll be happy to send a book to you. Just email your address and name. Thanks, that's very kind. And when we write to you all tomorrow, we will include that email address so that you can contact Dr. Tan. So you're going to India. There's a question here from India, uh, Dr. Cornelius, who's saying, we've got doctors and villagers in India. Many of them are quacks. In other words, they, you know, they're, they're charlatans. They don't know what they're doing. Um, and they're you know, just fleecing the patient. And it's a challenge to train them in ethical practices. What was your experience with village doctors in China? Were, were there alternative doctors? And uh, did you have any success in trying to train them or relate to them? Uh, two thoughts here. When I first went to China in 1936, I was welcomed by the communist government officials. And they asked me what was one of my aims. And I told them, I'm here to train your doctors and I'll teach them how to make money. <gasps> they were surprised. They said, what? Our doctors serve the people. I said, no, no, no. I'm from Singapore and I'll teach them to make money, to, to make it honestly. He said, wow, that is very difficult. <laughs> so in our training, uh, other than history taking, physical examination, diagnosis, we train them to write a lifestyle prescription, uh, nursing care, diet changes, lifestyle changes, and then medication because people were so reliant on medication and tablets. So we, we wanted them to train nursing care, lifestyle changes, dietary changes, hygiene, and at the bottom, yeah, maybe you need some antibiotics. Then, not the end, we ask them, how much would you charge the patient? We do this in class as a role play. That means I will say, okay, today uh, we have a 40 year old lady with pain passing urine. And they went through the whole history taking role play and they say, oh, this is bladder infection. I say, how would you treat? And they give nursing care, dietary care, drink more water and antibiotics. And then I will say, how much would you charge the patient? And we make the class discuss how much they will charge. So some of them will say, oh, charge 10 cents equivalent. I say, then your clinic will die. It's not sustainable. Some will say, I charge $25. I say, nobody's, then you are cheating. So we allow in the class to moderate in a way that they understand that they have to charge some money, uh, good profit and good accounting and business sense. That's how we got them to be honest because we saw, we taught them that in the long run, you have to be honest. How do we include the herbalists? So we asked the herbalists to teach. They will never teach because they are so, I mean, they are, I mean, all sorts of, like you say, quacks, right? So what we did is sometimes 
we, instead of a classroom, we created a mini market in the classroom. We asked reputable herbalists to bring three of their best herbs to display on the table. And our students behave like going to the market. I say, look, if you only have $2, which herbs would you buy? Surely you're not going to buy some that are no use. So they, and they will go up to the herbalist and speak as customer, buyer, and seller and negotiate what is this herb for, how much it's used, how much it costs. And so we try to build a body of truth or at least a good body of practice. I know nothing much about herbs, but I wanted them to exercise uh, reasonable judgment. Now, being able to do anything in a, in a village culture, but particularly in one where the culture and ethnicity and way of doing things is so different from what you're used to, mm. requires trust. How did you gain, as an outsider who didn't know the language, who there must have been some suspicion, how did you gain trust of the community? And if you had to state the number one important uh, method, what would that be? I, I bring my children and walk around. <laughs> they saw me not as a professional, they saw me as a father. Mm -hmm. I remember very distinctly in one leprosy uh, affected village, one leprosy village that we went to, uh, they responded to us. Uh, at first it was like very, so you are here to do a job. Yes, just go ahead and do it, you know. Lots of people have come to do, paint our house, build toilets. I mean, we thank, we are thankful, but we are lepers and they come and do the job, they go. And they welcome us quite differently. And I asked them why. Was it because I'm a good doctor? They say, no, because you brought your children. We have not seen children in our village for many years. <laughs> so building trust is relational. I think Jesus Christ showed the way. Uh, he incarnational. Jesus, I mean, when Jesus dwell among us, we know the theology, the tabernacle, right? So that's why Psalms 37 again, we dwell amongst the people just the same as Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus dwelt with us. Yes, yes. I remember when we were working in, in Kenya many years ago, my wife, who was a pediatrician, used to do the ward rounds with her baby on her back. And mm -hmm. that was that was um, a great icebreaker in terms of forming relationships. So it's the same incarnational model, isn't it? Yes. Uh, Charles Akafor is asking again, what, what inspired you to go on the missions in the village? And what was, and what you, you said initially that you were thinking you'd be more likely to go to somewhere like India where you didn't have to learn the language. But what, what inspired you to go on mission in remote villages? And what were the best encouragements you saw during your, your lengthy time there? Uh, well, uh, missions is a lot of waiting, right? There are so many needs out there. Uh, I love to go to India. I'm Like I say, I'm going to India next week. I, I enjoy the food, I, I enjoy the culture. Mm. I grew up in a school where my buddies were Indian, ethnic Indians in Singapore. Okay. But uh, there was, we just didn't match because at that time, uh, many of the needs was frontline service. Right? That means you were seeing 100 patients a day, 150 patients a day, which is needed. But both my wife and I, we, we saw ourselves more as educators and trainers that our passion was in sharing knowledge so we were kept looking for a place where uh, in fact in china i didn't have a medical license to treat right so my hands were tight i had to train okay. mm. so we thought there was a good fit yeah. what were the were the most uh, ken lim is asking what were the most common conditions you've met there and how easy was it to obtain the necessary medications when you needed them? Uh, well, it's a primary care practice. So from cough and cold, 
uh, everyday illnesses, uh, knee pain, joint pain among the elderly. Those were the bread and butter issues, right? But at the background was the malnutrition, anemia, tuberculosis, and then on the horizon was HIV AIDS because of the transmigration, uh, because of uh, very near to the Golden Triangle. So that was a big, big problem that uh, threatened to overwhelm. But I'm, I'm very happy to say that uh, the, the Chinese government came on with big projects and very detailed projects. And I think now we are assured that HIV is very well handled. The spread of HIV has didn't reach the, the fearful numbers. Uh, at one time, they were, they were saying that Yunnan will be the next uh, black hole for HIV, but it didn't happen. We are thankful for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, then as Yunnan prospered, uh, so they prospered, the government built roads, uh, so diabetes and hypertension became the next problem. Mm. Yes, and I guess we're, we're seeing that shift, aren't we, all over the mm. world with uh, non-communicable diseases. Mm. Yes, yeah, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tan, for sharing with us your, your wisdom, your experience and your insights uh, and your, your life and testimony as well. And, and sadly, that's all we've got time for today. So uh, thanks again, Dr. Tan. Thank you to all of you for coming along and making this a success. May God bless you, and we hope to see you again soon on ICMDA webinars. Thank you.